Hi, welcome to the Sankofa Pan-African series. We're pleased to have an awesome writer whose novel, The Day Must Come, will be our focus today. In this novel, a woman receives a letter a few days uh, before Christmas in 2007. The letter forces her to confront a secret that she has kept since 1960, which now threatens to destroy everything that is precious to her. But before we meet the author of this riveting novel, please click on your subscription and notification buttons. Thank you. Chinyomi Emegara, the author of The Day Must Come, was born in Enugu, southeastern Nigeria. She moved to the UK in 2006. Her love of reading was fostered in her at a really young age by her father, who took her on weekly bookshop visits. It's, it, it, these um, early impressions we make on our children can be very, very important. Now, Chidemi Emegara holds a Bachelor of Arts uh, in uh, Mass Communication and an MSc uh, in Human Resources Management. Uh, she focuses on preserving an African and globally relevant identity for herself whilst enabling a strong sense of identity in her three children as well. But before we meet Chinemi, let's hear what Gabriella has to share with us about the novel, The Day Must Come. Now, The Day Must Come is a book with a lot of heart. Readers are able to feel everything Chioma does her pain, her guilt, and even her shame. The author is so masterful at storytelling and is able to carry the rhythm along through every chapter of the book. The book moves between different time periods, particularly the 1960s and the mid 2000s. Different important topics are discussed in the book, such as racism, rape, trials of womanhood, particularly um, how society views single mothers or, you know, women who get pregnant outside marriage. Also, um, we're able to see the beautiful friendship between women. Even though Chioma and Atunuke did not always see eye to eye, Atunuke put her feelings aside and helped out when Chioma needed her. It is also interesting to note that Rita has not learned Chioma's name until the fifth chapter. The Day Must Come is an absolute delight to read. It's available on Amazon, Kindle, and Audible. Thanks, Gabby. Hi, Chinemi. Really exciting to have you on the Sankofa Pan-African series. So, one of the things I find most fascinating about uh, your novel, The Day Must Come, is the fact that Chioma, the protagonist, it's not named until the about the fifth chapter. Yeah, you know, it's, it's a rather intriguing style, I think. Uh, intriguing style. So, mm. was it intentional uh, not to have Thelma named until your reader are uh, so far into the story? <laughs> yeah, and I think I think that's interesting. I think I found that question interesting in itself. Um, but it did reflect the the type of reader that I am. I think that was where that came from because I immersed myself in, in the story. So what I tried to get the reader to do was to understand who Chioma was and almost at that point name her. And from that point onwards, you could see that the name was used in that sense. Um, and by chapter five, that was a combination of her experiences. So actually her experiences were the quite opposite of her name in that sense. Um, but for me, it was more important that the reader got to know Chioma through the many lenses that we saw up to that point. I, it's, it's, I think it's a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant style. I mean, as a writer myself, I'm like, wow, this is, this is something you must have really thought about. <laughs> and yeah. then you must have actually deliberately also resisted using that name. And I can just imagine, you know, all the, uh, uh, all the play having to choose you know, the nouns yeah. and things like that without giving... Uh, Absolutely. It's brilliant. Thank well, you. I love it. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> now, um, 
Okay, so you're going to share and accept with us before we... <laughs> I will. A few more questions. All right, brilliant. And I've got the book here now, which is good. <laughs> yes, yes. Um. So I'm going to read from, um, I think, chapter five, and you let me know when you want me to stop. Give us a, a background to the part that you're reading so that uh, we can put it in perspective for us. All right, brilliant. So leading up to the, the part I'm about to read is we get to know the character, Choma, who is the main character in the book. We get to see her through the eyes of her family. We get to get a glimpse of what the story is centered around. Um, and the build up to that. And I think for the reader and the feedback I've had is around, it, it spans across different times in her life. So we begin to travel with her and know her really well. I think chapter five is an interesting one to read because at that point we know what has happened. Well, it is a that point she has got the letter. That is yes. Yeah, her Absolutely. So she's got the letter that will tear her family apart. We, she's, then forced to confront things. What happens is, is the buildup of a story, which I won't give away at this point. <laughs> um, but then the, the, this chapter I'm about to read or parts of it sort of show some of the raw emotion um, that comes across in the book um, and some of the really difficult topics that readers may find. Yes, so I'll start then. I have been feeling funny for the past few weeks. It must be the salad I had at the cafeteria. I have been in such a daze, going from day to day. My routine being lectures, my room, lectures. Attending my lectures kept me from going mad. The good thing was the lecturer seems to have some sort of pack to wear us out. I just needed to keep going. I haven't spoken to Atinuke since that night. I barely slept after I came back. I kept drifting into sleep and then relieving the whole experience. Finally, rather than sit in my room, almost losing my mind, I got dressed and went for my first lecture of the day. I was in the lecture room, but I wasn't there. I did not speak to anyone, I just stared. My mind was blank. The funny thing was, once I was awake, I could not bring myself to think about what happened. However, back in my room, once I drifted off, I felt his arms pinning me down. I think, however, that going for the lecture the next morning is what helped me keep my sanity, if that's what you choose to call my present state. I avoided Atinika like the plague. She came to my room a few times, and since I refused to open the door, even though she knew I was there, she got the message and let me be. Today, I will go and see my GP if they can accommodate me. I went off and for once since I rolled, I could see the doctor 45 minutes after I got there, someone had canceled. Seeing the doctor, he asked me a couple of health questions and sent me off for some blood tests. The test results will be ready in four days. I was told by the cherry nurse who took my blood samples and off I went to school. I've just gone back. Was it only four days ago that I thought my problems could not get worse? If this was Juju sent from home, it was working well. My life was going from bad to worse. I had just come to collect my tests and the doctor gleefully informed me that I was pregnant. How could I be pregnant? As the doctor said those words, I fell back and stared at him. Mama, Mama, how could I explain this to her? All her dreams broken, the shame, the disgrace. Who would believe my story? Yes, I went with Ben. Did I know this would happen? As I sat with these thoughts running through my mind, I realized the doctor was still speaking, Dr. Henry Smith. I remember his name as clear as day. He was asking if I was okay. I didn't see anyone and I just walked out. The campus surgery was a good 30 minutes from my halls of residence. And usually I would take the shuttle, but today I just walked. I found myself in front of the hall. Who would I see but Atinoke? As soon as I saw her, I burst into tears. I wailed, I screamed. I was panting with each wail. 
The halls stood still. It was all eyes on me. I could not be bothered. I was utterly devastated. What had I done to God? What was my crime? The only night I decided to let my hair down, I got raped. If that was not bad enough, I was pregnant. Who could I tell my story? How would I tell mama? This would kill her. Atinuke stared for about half a minute. The next she had her arms around me, comforting me as she said, oh, what is it? Come on, let's go in. I'm sure we can sort this out. Oh, did anything happen at home? As she asked me the million and one questions, she stared me towards her room. That did not, however, stop her from having the final word. She turned to an audience that held their mouths agape and said, is this the first time you're seeing a woman cry? Get on with your lives. Oh, Atinuke, I remember thinking at that time, you are bossy. I, first of all, I love the French, the relationship between Chioma and Atinuke. I'm Absolutely. But, but before I come to that, the, the way you handled this issue of rape, I think it's uh, fantastic. Because you, you help us get into this girl's head in ways that, you know, when you read story, I mean, newspaper reports or accounts of rape, we don't have access to. Um, what, what kind of research did you do to, to be able to, <laughs> to write, you know, such a moving and um, also eye-opening, you know, um, way of dealing with, with rape? I did a lot of research and it, it's such a sensitive topic. You don't want to get it wrong. You don't want to make assumptions because of, like you said, we're just reading the papers. Um, and as a writer, I'm sure you will appreciate that. When you start doing your research, it takes you into a dark place because you get to read and almost you, you have to take yourself out of it. So it was really extensive around the experiences it was around research around how women feel. It was around research around um, universities and what happened within it. And it was that global lens on things as well. Yeah. And yeah. sadly enough, you know, it is... University. Sorry? In uh, Oxford University in the UK. It, yeah, in Cambridge, in Cambridge University. Sorry. Cambridge. No, that's good. Yes. So you then find the patterns almost. You find that things haven't gotten better. Um, over the years, you find that the stigma still exists, and that's what I'm talking about, the dark space, you almost see that women... Um, mm. And I, this was not somebody who, mm. like, met her in a dark corner or anything like that. It was like, almost like a date, date rape. This was um, someone she dealt with. Yeah, she had met him, she had met him fleetingly on a bus, um, and then this was her second meeting, but she was aware of him, and she met him in a safe environment. Yeah. you know christmas dinner party how yeah. where you almost relax your guard and all and that's the way it happens and mm -hmm. when you look at the research that talks about people that people know um yeah. happening so yeah it is it is that yeah. that's one of the things i like about uh, what you do with it this is not read by a stranger because there are ways in which people kind of justify those type of rapes. yeah yeah, to try and justify it. Oh, maybe maybe it was uh, at least she knew the person. At least kind of people try and it can be easily downplayed, you know. The way you dealt with it, you know, the fact that she let him, you know, was not reduced from the importance or from 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 the pain, you know, and the damage that it does, you know. So I. Uh, readers will be forced to actually think about this thing that we call date rape. Absolutely. And, and that's the thing, isn't it? It's all the perceptions of, of what it is. I think the fundamental, if someone says no, if someone has not given consent, whatever the nature of the relationship, and that is what people find difficult to understand. Mm. <laughs> so now going back to Atinoke and Chioma. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, as I said, I, I find the way you've crafted their relationship very, Thank very... Uh, I, I love their I love their relationship. I mean, no friendship is perfect. Yes. <laughs> and I'm also aware of this saying that we get thrown at us as women, although women are their own worst enemies and all of that, you know. But here you've given us, you know, two women um, 
you know, um, who, who find that common ground, you know, mm -hmm. them, you know, into a really meaningful uh, uh, friendship. So can you please share your inspiration for that friendship? <laughs> yeah, I, think, I think when I read this, when I thought about their friendship, uh, for me, I've always had a tribe of women supporting me. Thank you. Um, so I, um, I don't buy into that whole. Their relationship reads like you know you actually know you have to read. I have Atinokes in my life, and I've known Atinokes in my family, and I've known Atinokes in my work life. You know, I've, for me, they, I find that it is the beauty of the relationship comes from that common ground. Something must bring you together, but you know, it's a tribe of women supporting you. It's being there for you. I grew up knowing them. You know, I grew up with my mom with her sisters and I grew up with friends in that same light. And um, in my second book, I see the same thing. You know, when I reflect on it now, I'm like, oh goodness, I must then rely on this tribe of women more than I know because there is something there. And I found that the people that have challenged me, that have pushed me, have been that tribe. Um, and they're there to tell you the truth. You know, you get to find it. So it must not always be the pleasant or your wonderful friend, but being there for you through thick and thin and supporting you through life. And a friend of mine says it's adulting with you, being an adult with you, that's what we do, isn't it? Awesome, man. Mm -hmm. very friendship. <laughs> it's, yeah. a, it's a friendship that people who read, uh, who read your novel would always would refer to for a long time coming. And it's also a relationship that would also people would okay when they are like going through some patches with their <laughs> with their yes. tribe of women. They'll, oh, okay, look. I'm absolutely, sure. absolutely, yeah, you're right, and that's what you draw on. You know, I yeah, you know, very, very. The, the friendship is is nuanced in a in a really um, very realistic. Way. And and I think with I think and Chema, if I may, um, you also find they don't come from the same background. So that's interesting in itself. They also come from different tribes. And for me, that is the beauty of the friendship where all those things do not matter. It is a meeting of the minds yeah. um, and how you sort of play into that. In, in my second book, I play that with smoke and mirrors, but you see it through the lens of a sibling and a friend. And it's the same support. It's the same, you know, support there for you and, and taking you through things. And some of the, these other things don't matter because once you have that common ground with someone there must be something that you click around tribe race all those things do not matter it's your you know the meeting of the mind so to speak yes yeah yes, mm. yes, yes thank you now uh my next question is um is the fact is sent from the fact that a tumor does not report the rape <laughs> incident <laughs> um and i'm wondering how much of a role does a uh, her skin color could have skin color have played in, in her silence? That wasn't the dominant reason at all. Okay. Far from it. Okay. I think yeah. So for, for her, you know, when that part I read showed you where her, her buttons were pushed, her motivators, her mother. Shame. I went with him. Those are common trends. So the self-blame. They wanted this to disappear. If she didn't get pregnant, that would have been the end of it. She would have just moved on with her pain, obviously, and every devastation and who knows what else would happen in her mind. Um, so I don't think the race thing, but also if you think about Choma, she was there on scholarship, who was who, who was a perpetuator, someone on a different social class. She didn't think she would be believed. And that is a problem. You know, for most victims, they don't think they'll be believed, you know, when they sort of report it. So I think it went, race wasn't the dominant factor. It was all these other complex mix of things, which is she was just here to do, get her education and go. What was the purpose of reporting this and having the attention back on her? So while she knew she didn't cause it, but she didn't want that attention, it was in her mind, it was the wrong sort of attention for right or wrong reasons. And she couldn't bear to deal with not being believed, having to revisit it. She wanted to wish it away. Thank you, I look forward to we're reading more from you in the, in the near future. Thank you. Yeah, definitely. I've, I've got a second book, uh, Smoke and Mirrors, so that's out as well. Um, so, yeah. So, I, I didn't think it was in general. Smoke and Mirror. Okay. Yeah, Smoke and Mirrors, yeah. Where, where can uh, 
You guys pick that one up. <laughs> it's on Amazon and Audible. It's on Amazon. So you've got the, the Day Must Come, and then you've got Spoke and Mirrors. <laughs> so that's on Amazon and Audible as well. Um, because for me, accessible um, reading is very important through all the channels. Yes, yes. Well done. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much for the time as well. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe to the Sankofa Pan African series channel. Like our videos and please share them with your contacts.